lesson from the Word. And then uh, the last 15 minutes, we're going to uh, witness our brother Mark Campbell being baptized. We'll, um, we'll be singing Just As I Am without one plea, and at that time Mark will go out to get ready, and then we'll gladly witness the baptism. We've begun a series in the book of Samuel. I'd like you to, today, for a short, simple lesson, I'd like you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We talked about this chart a little uh, last week, and um, for time's sake, we won't be talking about it today, but basically on that chart are the major stories in the book of Samuel. First and second Samuel are one book originally in the Bible, and the theme of the book is how do we recognize who the real king is? There were two kings on the throne at the time. There were two kings anointed, shall I say. One was on the throne, King Saul, with his wealth and his armies, and the other was David living in caves. And Israel had to make a choice. Who would they swear allegiance to? Saul offered them his wealth and the lands. All David had was the Lord. And the right choice was David, the man after God's own heart. The big theme is still the big theme today. For right now, today, there is one who is the prince of the power of the air. He is Satan, Lucifer, his satanic majesty, and he rules and he offers the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. To one he offered, if you will just bow down and worship him. And there are many today who flock to this world and give their allegiance to him. For Jesus right now seems weak, hidden as if he were in a cave, on the run. And those who follow him seem, well, rather peculiar, rather strange, almost pilgrim type. Whom will mankind choose? Who is the real king? The choice the Samuel will say is watch for the one who's rejected. Look for the one who uh, is the one the majority says no to. Give a good look to David. Give a good look to Christ. He is the one. This morning I want to focus on a very early story right at the beginning. We mentioned at the beginning of the book, One Mighty Woman, and a, a, a song or a prayer that she writes is how the book starts, and that's Hannah. And then you go through the years in the book, And at the end, you come to not one mighty woman, but many mighty men. And a psalmist in Israel, and Israel is filled with songs. And this morning, I want us to focus on one aspect of that woman's life, Hannah's Hannah's life there. Because if we get that aspect right, the same thing can happen in our lives. A little thing becomes much when God is in it. So let's read a little bit here, because not everybody knows the story here. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to read a couple of verses here. Now there was a certain man in Rethrahem Zephon of the Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And the man went up to, out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were in Shiloh. And when the time came that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and his sons and his daughters portion. But to Hannah... He gave a worthy portion, or more, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, Penina, provoked her sore to make her frets, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, Penina provoked her. Therefore, Hannah was brought to tears, and she did not eat. There are people like that in our lives, you know, sources of that in our lives, provoking us, trying to discourage us, trying to turn us away from the Lord. 
Elkanah said to her husband, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Notice this verse, please. So Hannah rose up, she's in this temple, rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat on the seat by the post of the temple. The great priest was watching, and she was in the temple praying. She was praying, but look at how she prays in verse 10. She's in bitterness of soul, and she prays unto the Lord, and she weeps sore. And she vowed a vow. When's the last time you needed something from God? When's the last time you really believed that God could help? When's the last time you entreated the Lord? You prayed like this. And she meant business. And she vowed a vow. And she said to the Lord, If thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a child, you'll take away the mass in the kidney. You'll answer the need that I have right now, Lord. You'll give me that child. Then, see, what will you do with it? Then... I will give him unto you all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass. What a prayer. It came to pass that as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Notice verse 13, please. For Hannah spoke in her heart, her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. One of the greatest prayers in the Bible is a woman, and you didn't hear her voice. It's not what's on the outside that counts. Our brother Mark is going to be baptized this morning. And we're going to see him do something on the outside that is thrilling for all of us. But it's not what's on the outside that counts. This great prayer, no one understood what she was saying. Don't ever think because you're moved by God to pray quietly. Sisters in the meeting, I know the Bible asks us, asks you, To remain silent, it doesn't mean that there isn't great works going on here. Here's an example of a woman, and she prayed and laid hold of God. It's what's on the inside that counts. It's what's on the inside that counts. And Eli was looking and thought she was drunk. And they came to speak to her. Skip down to verse 19. In verse 19, they arose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. That's one of the greatest things in the Bible. That the Lord remembers you. That the Lord will hear your voice. That this world has forgotten you. You're a social security number to the United States government. And heaven forbid you lose your cards. Trust me, I know. (laughs) You're really then a nobody, right? Yeah, but not to the Lord. Not to the Lord. The Lord had his eye on this woman, Hannah. The Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass in verse 20, that when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and she called his name Samuel, saying, because I have, what? Asked for him from the Lord. Skipping down to verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her and three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli, and she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, I am that woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. Why would he remember her? Maybe it was because there weren't very many. You know, they got into the habit of just coming to this sanctuary and offering up their sacrifices and making sure everything got in 
They didn't have to go in and pray, you know. We got our sacrifice done. Let's get the kids home. Come on, let's get going. The routine of the things of the house of the Lord. And maybe it was, maybe it was just that, that she was different, that there were only a few that really got what it was all about. Why did you do all those sacrifices anyway? So you could feel good that your sins were forgiven? No, no, no. Your sins were forgiven by the sacrifices so that you would enter into God's presence and lay hold of him, entreat him of the Lord. Eli is going to be so upset with his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, because they're busy eating all the food from off the sacrifices. They couldn't care less about going into the house of God and laying hold of God for the great needs of the Israelite nation and these young tribes. He will come to them and he'll say, you've committed sin in the sanctuary. Who is going to entreat the Lord, ask the Lord to save Israel? They couldn't care less about it. And here was this young woman, Hannah. And she said, I'm the one who was praying. And I prayed, verse 27, for this child. And the Lord hath given me my petition as I asked. And now I am lending him to the Lord, giving him back to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be the Lord's. And they bowed down and they worshipped then. We have a couple of other readings here, but I'm going to skip them for time's sake right now. I want to give you a little bit of background here on where Israel is. Israel is a young nation. So we've just finished last year those studies in the book of Joshua. You remember those battles as the Israelites came in under the... Uh, generalship of Joshua, and they were given great victory into the la- in the land. And now it is a nation of tribes, like many of the early nations, many of the African nations, many of the Arab nations. They started out as tribes. There are 12 tribes in Israel right now, and they are settling into their towns, and they are settling into their farms, and they are starting to build their nation. There is no king. The Lord was their king. The Lord was giving them direction. And this was how it was supposed to work. Throughout all of the tribes, there were priests. There were Levites. They lived in certain cities. And what were the roles of those priests and those Levites? There was one central city called Shiloh. And when we think about priests, we think about Shiloh usually, where the sacrifices were offered and where the animals were killed and where the Day of Atonement took place. Very important city, Shiloh. But there were 12 other cities where the priests were and other cities where the priests were. They were scattered all throughout Israel. And what were those priests supposed to be doing in Israel? Well, if God is going to be the king, someone's got to remind the people of the glory and the awe of God. And so it wasn't just about making sure the sacrifices were done on a ritualistic basic basis, though that was important. The priest's number one job was to meet the ordinary Israelite on the street and to remind him of the glory of God, to keep his eye, her eye focused on the Lord. For if he is going to be the king and he is invisible, it is easy to forget about him. And the priests were to be in love with the Lord, filled with the stories of the Lord, being able to talk about how the Lord did so many things for them in the past. Don't you forget that, dear priests of God, here in this room right now. It is not just about the breaking of bread and the remembering of Christ, but it is also in our daily walk, reminding God's people of the glory of Christ constantly in our lives lest it become something that for many churches today, it's a Sunday morning only experience and throughout the rest of the week, their eyes, the eyes of so many Christians are off the Savior and on to other things. And those priests, that was what it was supposed to be. They were supposed to be energized for the Lord, working for the Lord and reminding God's people who the real king was. And as you're finding out, On your Tuesday night studies in the book of Judges, something drastic had happened. The priesthood had completely collapsed. Whether they were underfunded and their homes were in disrepair, we don't know what happened, but even Moses' grandson, one of the great Levite priests, 
turned to idolatry and began to tell the people of God to worship other things than the Lord. And it was only a matter of time before the great statement in the book of Judges, which is where Samuel starts, is read, there is no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. I've been carrying this article around with me for years because I want to mention it in a sermon once, and I've never mentioned it. It's an article about the Second World War. It explains why it all happened. The Soviets, the Nazis, the liberators of civilization. What, what were they all thinking? Why did this happen? The writer said, the premise of the book is, well, they all knew that what they were doing was right. They all thought that what they were doing was right. The book of the Proverbs tells us there is a way that seems right unto a man. There are a few individuals in life here who decide to do the wrong thing. But most human beings think, even when they're making the biggest mistake of their life, that they're doing it the right way. That they're right. There was no king in Israel. Everyone was doing that which was right in his own eyes. And because of that, there was no power with God. There was no one laying hold of God for protection, for help with the crops. This little woman, Hannah, was in the minority. She was by herself. Israel was defenseless. And because of that, they were constantly under attack. In this case, it's the Philistines through the book of Samuel. Constantly under attack, constantly having to defend themselves. They were wondering what to do. Israel is in a desperate need. Israel needed some help. That's the background of this book and our simple lesson today. <laughs> when you need help, what do you do? What do you do? Hannah decided to turn to God. Now, Hannah's need in this case was not a big national need. It wasn't about the, she wasn't concerned. Well, I think she was concerned about where Israel was going. But her need, at least introduced to us in this story, is very private. She wanted a son. And between Elkanah and Penina and Hannah, we don't know that anybody else realized what was wrong, why Hannah couldn't have a son. The Bible just says that the Lord wouldn't give it to her. Her womb was closed up, and it bothered her sorely. She was embarrassed in life because of it. She had a desperate need to have a child, it was something that she wanted. It doesn't make a difference with God whether the need is one that is very private to the individual or very public to the nation. Our God is a God who wants to meet our needs. And unlike Eli's sons, Hannah believed that God could do something about her situation. That God could do something about her situation. I want you to listen to some of the words in her prayer. You don't need to turn to it. Uh, we read her prayer the last time we were together. Here's what she says about the Lord. It is the Lord that makes poor. It is the Lord that makes rich. It is the Lord that brings down the high to be low, and it's the Lord that lifts up the low to be high. He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifts up the beggar from the dunghill. He sets them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. Oh, she believed that. She believed that the Lord could help. I know if I asked you all the question today, can the Lord help you? I know you will, you'll all say yes. But do you really believe it? When's the last time you laid hold of him? Listen to how she lays hold of the Lord. We didn't read these verses, but El e Eli confronts her because she thinks he's drunk. And this is what she says, I am not drunk. 
I am a woman that's sorrowful. I'm in chapter 1, verse 15. Sorrowful in spirit. I have not drunk wine or strong drink. You know, there are a lot of people who turn to that in life. Even Christians have struggle, struggles with that. You need to fight that. You need to keep fighting that. Never give in to that. One day God will bring you deliverance. But don't let that be your source of help. The Lord is your source of help. And here she says this, No, no, I haven't turned to drink. I've poured out my soul. I've poured out my soul before the Lord. You know, what is the greatest expression of the Christian life? I guess there's so many, isn't there? Being baptized, what an expression of being a Christian. Regularly attending church and being a part of a great group like Bethany Gospel Chapel, it's a wonderful thing. Reading your Bible, having devotions at home, oh, my goodness. You sit down with Mr. and Mrs. Brayton and rattle off a list of the things that you can do in your home. Great things for Christ. Wonderful things. Expressions of Christ. At work, the things you can do at work. But at the end of the day, one of the purest expressions of your faith in God is to lay hold of him in prayer and ask him to intervene in your life, isn't it? At the end of the day. And how many Christians have lost sight of that basic thing in my life and are involved with great Christian ideas and programs and wonderful things and Bible study habits and all that. And after the day is all done and I've worked as hard as I could for Jesus Christ at the office and I've tried to love my wife as Christ loved the church and take care of my kids and all the things that God has asked me to do. And then I go to sleep and I look back. Did I ever really spend time pouring out my soul before the Lord? I need help, Lord. I need you now, Lord. A son, dear Lord, that was her prayer. A son. Please, a son. And if you give me my son, I'll give him back to you. Now, that's a prayer that God will answer. I'll give him back to you. That's what life's about. That's what the Christian life is about. Lord, I need this. You give it to me. I'll give it right back to you. I'll give it right back to you. And so here we are today as we come to a close to our little short and little sermon here. And I'm wondering if there's someone today that has a private need, a need that no one else knows about. God knows about it. Maybe your life is a wreck in turmoil. The future looks dark. You have no hope. We've been singing songs this morning about turning your eyes upon Jesus. You know, before the Lord Jesus went to the cross in John 10.10, 10, this is what he said as he's facing the cross to die. This is what he said. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for you. If you're here this morning and you're looking for a changed life, you need to turn to the Lord for help. He is the one who can change your life. Eli's sons let sin come between them and the Lord. They had no power with God. And this morning, if you're here outside of Christ, it's because the pleasure of sin is in the way. That it is something that you are still looking for and living for and you don't want to give it up. 
You need to turn from sin and turn to God. A life, dear God. A life. Give me that life. And here it is. And if God gives you that new life, what are you going to do with it? What did Hannah do with the gift she was going to get? What are you going to do with that life? I'm going to give it back to you, Lord. I'm going to give it back to you. And so this morning, as we close this little session here and get ready to witness this baptism, if you're here today and your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Our Lord Jesus Christ can come in and give you that life. And that life can be an abundant life, a satisfying life. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed. And this morning, if the Lord has been speaking to you, I want you to do what Hannah did quietly. No one has to even know. Lay hold of him in prayer. Pour out your soul before him and ask him to help. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. If anyone hears his voice and opens the door, Jesus Christ comes in. And when Jesus Christ comes in, you become a new person. Old things are passed away and everything becomes brand new. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of this little woman, this mighty woman of God, and still down through the years, down through the years, she does impress us. She believed God, and it was counted up to her for righteousness. We pray, Lord, that you would help us not necessarily be impressed with her, but be impressed with the Lord and to turn to him more and more so that we might be like Hannah in treating of the Lord, coming into his presence. The Bible tells us men ought always to pray and not to faint. We pray now that you would bless the rest of this service, this baptism. Help us, Lord, to say at the end of it all that our eyes were not necessarily on Mark or on the preacher or on the ritual of baptism, but that our eyes were caught up by Jesus, that we might see him in a clearer way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Mark, we're going to excuse you right now. It changed, and we're going to turn in our hymn books to 373. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. 373. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Before we sing the next verse, Mark Campbell and I worked together at Suffolk Construction. Mark also worked with Mickey 
In a previous light, he owned a company uh, that worked out of uh, Worcester here. And uh, when I met Mark, we were on a project called the Weston Hotel in uh, downtown Providence. He worked for a man named Nick Ruckey, a good friend of mine, a hard boss for, for uh, Mark Campbell. Very demanding, demanding boss, Nick Ruckey. Nick Ruckey knows that Mark is being baptized today, and he does send his regards. He is not a believer. But Nick was the one who introduced me to Mark and mentioned to me that uh, he was struggling with some things. And as I got to know Mark, it became very clear that his wife was very, very ill. We've never met her. She is very sick. And um, it was, uh, and it still is very hard on our brother Mark. And I, as I talked to him a little bit about that, he was interested in receiving a Bible. And that was the first time I had a chance to speak with him about, about Jesus. And at the same time, Mickey was coming to know Christ too. And Mickey was talking to Mark. Long, long talks about the Lord. Mark got transferred to a project down in Foxwoods. And um, he and I lost contact for a little bit. But he'd been reading his Bible, talking to Mickey. And I got an email one day. um, Tom, I need to see you right away. We have to talk about God. So I drove down to the uh, casino job site. (laughs) And I must have been driving Mark crazy. Mark is one of the brightest builders in New England. He can build anything. And I made a commitment to the client that we could build his casino without really drawings. (laughs) And basically what I was doing was saying, Mark just do what I'm thinking in my mind, and it just drove the team absolutely crazy. But he was the only guy who could do it, and Nick Ruckey will say this to his day, you know, Mark was the best builder I've ever met, best builder he could put it together. And, um, but I went down there, and um, Nick knew that Mark was having trouble, and uh, Nick knew that I was meeting with him. We met for about two hours at lunch, and it was just rapid-fire questions. Okay, Tom. The Bible doesn't do science, so how can you believe the Bible? You know, the first question. How do you know the Bible is the Word of God? I can't see God. Where's, why is God in just two hours of just, this guy was looking, not necessarily, well, he was looking for answers. And he wanted to know, he wanted to know why Mickey had decided that it was Christ. And he wanted to know why I had decided it was Christ. A few weeks after that, he had uh, left Suffolk Construction and got to work for someone else, and then the economy collapsed, and he was out of work. That's when he started coming to Bethany Gospel Chapel here and um, was under the ministry of our brother, Mike Rieger, that it finally dawned. It wasn't just Mike. There were many people. He would say, boy, that brother Bob Brayton, that sermon was great. Oh, that brother Ralph, what a... Dan, he just... The Lord was working every time... He was out listening. But it was under Brother Mike's ministry. It finally dawned on him, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And um, this morning, we're here not to see him saved. He's already been saved. It's already happened on the inside. This is an expression on the outside that he wants us all to know. And with that in mind, I'd like us to sing the um, third verse and then we'll see if they're ready to come in. Okay, the third verse of 373. <clears throat> Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings within, and fears with. Without, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. And verse 6, the last verse. Just as I am, thy love unknown, with broken every barrier down, now to Mark Campbell, have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. On the basis of your testimony of accepting and receiving. 
receiving our Lord Jesus Christ, this assembly of local Christians now baptizes you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 